Darius Coombs, um, Nash B. Wampanoag. Um, I'm mean, the director of, of Wampanoag and Algonquin inter Interpretive Training here in um, over 30 years. I went to school in Plymouth, Plymouth, United States here. In seventh grade, we made a field trip up here and they never brought us down to the Wampanoag home site. They brought us to the Pilgrim Village and that's it. I didn't know this place existed, the home site, until I came here. We're a cultural program, you know. Um, we hire native indigenous people from South, Central, North America, because we're all similar. Um, I live right in the community of Mashpee, being a Wampanoag community on Cape Cod. It's one of the oldest and the biggest still today. And all of my cousins come up to me at the country store and say, hey, Trice, can I work where you work? And I'll look at them, I said, okay. I know you're good at making baskets. I know you're good at making woodwork, but can you talk to hundreds if not thousands a day of guests from all around the world about slavery, about cultural genocide, about colonization without getting upset at the guest? And they'll look at me like, um, I don't know if I can do that. And the reason they say that is because it's real for our people. It still hurts inside. How people come in to the museum, especially when they come down to the Wampanoag home site, how they're gonna feel about us when they first come in, how they're gonna leave, it's, it's a really big thing. It, we, we want them to come in thinking one way and leaving another. Because what they know about native people in general is what they see on TV and old movies and such, which is not accurate, you know? They portray a lot of native people from out west. Um, people on horses and going around killing people all the time. And you hear the terms warlike and peaceful. And those two terms have always been stuck on native people. You cannot describe any culture as being warlike or peaceful. That's totally disrespectful, you know? But that's what a lot of people know, know about us, you know? So when they're coming down to the Wampanoag home site, they don't know how to act a lot of the time. You see them like walk on eggshells. I'm not sure what to say. You can just read their faces. So a we two might hold maybe six to eight people. And how that's built is the frame is made out of white cedar. So what you do is you put one pole one side, you pack it with stone first, to make your arch. You get another arch, a pole on this side, and what you do, you tie strings up here, right? So the pole itself might be 20 feet up in the air. And so you got people on this side, people on this side. They take the ropes and pull them together. Then that forms a perfect arch, right? So you, the arch houses are dome-shaped houses. You start off high in the middle, and you're slightly going down on both sides. So you have your arches, right? Once you get your arches all done, you have to put rings around the houses, cedar rings. and a ring is a pole that bends around the house going horizontally and that ties all the arches together and every maybe two foot up you put a ring so you might have three or four rings going up and you tie your frame together with hickory bark and also spruce root and that's when you go out and get the bark you get it fresh and it's going to mold exactly the way you want it then you have, have an exterior frame which goes on the outside that holds the bark together Wampanoag being a nation of people that spread in large parts of Massachusetts. And amongst that nation, we had probably about, se we, had, we had about 70 communities, right? With different names. Around this area of Plymouth, this was called Patuxet. And that means place with little waterfalls. So you would um, move into your winter community. A winter community could hold anywhere from 400 people to four or 5,000 people. And that's when you live in those bark, big bark covered houses. Our bark covered houses could get anywhere from 100, 200 foot in length. Very, very large, could hold maybe 10, 15, 20 families being somehow related on the inside. And that's when you hunt, of course. Uh, go for the four big animals, the men would hunt with the bow and arrow, use deadfall traps, the black bear. The woman will probably spend a lot of time inside the houses cooking and weaving baskets and mats and bags, making clothing. And the elders of the community can do whatever they want to do. They've been there, done that. They got the wisdom, they got the knowledge. Um, their main responsibility is, is, is to tell those stories to the kids. Our tradition has always been oral. 
So it's always been spoken, it's always been passed down. Each community would have a leader, a chief. A leader would have the council. They made the best decisions for the community. We have medicine people still today. You hear a lot about medicine men back then. Most of our medicine people were considered to be women back then. And they have a lot of power if they want. They have more power than the chief. If they don't, if they don't see the chief doing the right thing, what they can do is take that person out of power, put somebody else in. Normally that didn't happen. Normally leadership was passed out father to son. Although we know there was women leaders back then. We know the Wiedemos, we know the Awashanks. If the, if the son wasn't capable enough running the government, you pass it to your daughter. We have a difference between our culture and other cultures is we, we have a lot of respect for our women. You got to respect anything that gives life. The women control anything that goes on in the house, right? Divorce is really rare back then. If you got married, if you had your, when you had your ceremony, that's a heavy thing, still is today. And that what you meant to be. Or some things happened, you know? So if a woman wanted to get a divorce from her husband, the only thing she had to do was take the man's belongings and put it in front of the door. So if he came back from hunting, he started stuff out there, he, he would have to leave. The idea of the project is to bring over some representatives of the Wampanoag Nation who will share some building skills, traditional craft skills, and their stories, their culture, their heritage with local people in Basseville particularly with the local school groups we're hoping to bring um, to have some sessions and, ex and see the Wetu being built, hear stories, share that culture. The Wampanoag were really involved with the um, interpretation in the Pilgrim's Gallery from the start. We were very keen not to put words in their mouths, so they approved all the interpretation about the native way of life within the Pilgrim's Gallery. So there was a really strong working relationship there already. And there was this idea that we could share culture in this way, um, comparing perhaps the traditional Nottinghamshire mud and stud building techniques with the We Too um, architecture and the, the native skills from both regions. So the house you're gonna see over there next this year, hopefully this year, I wanna say 16 foot long, 14 foot wide, and that's 10 foot in height. So that, you want to use at least 10 foot height because it draws nice to fire. And in the middle, you have a smoke hole and that allows the smoke to go out. And we just don't want to build it and leave it. There has to be some information, literature board or something there that people can learn from. It's important because this this show our, our culture over there. So we just want people to know about our people that we're still here and we're not going anywhere. <laughs>